Born in Canada, in a small town, youngest of nine children, had wonderful parents, had the opportunity to play the greatest game in the world, played with some of the greatest players in the world, against some of the greatest players in the world. What more could a man ask for? Now the series switches to the Detroit Olympia, the home of the Stanley Cup bound Detroit Red Wings. Leading two games to none and needing only two more victories in a possible five games, Detroit is a strong favorite. As far as Olympia, yes, I'll always have great memories of that. It was a major, major part of my life. It was a wonderful life and a wonderful career in a wonderful city. Lindsay and Spunky, Paul Meager of Canadians, tangle in the corner and Lindsay takes a penalty. Shot drives McNeil to the ice from the side of the net. Ted Lindsay pokes in the loose puck to make the score 2 1. <laughs> Canadians are wearing their white home ice uniforms, and the Red Wings are in dark sweaters. Detroit's production line Sid Abel, number 12, Ted Lindsay, number 7, and Gordy Howe, number 9, dominate the play. So he had some hockey ability, and he said, I'm going to make good with it. And he became one of the best in the world. There was only one reason I played, and that was to win. To win meant that you had to give your best, plus a little bit extra. You had to dominate your opposition. You won however you won. Whether it meant that I had to go through you, over you, whether I had to cut you, or whatever it took to win. That was my desire, and because there was only one reason I was there, that was to win. He was a tough, hard-nosed hockey player, and, and he was no giant of a man, as you can see that, but uh, there's nobody, nobody had any more guts than he did. He could skate well, he could shoot well, he could pass well, he could check well, and he didn't save his body from whatever had to be done to prevent somebody else from scoring. He was the first competitor. He was the toughest player pound for pound in the National Hockey League back then. He'd take on anyone. You cut him for five and he'd cut you for ten. As I always used to try to make sure that uh, I got even. If you got me dirty, I would make sure that I got you back. And it probably was dirty too if you got me dirty. But I, I used to keep that ledger pretty even. Uh, I wanted you to owe me. I didn't want to owe you. The trouble there was Ted. There. Sure, Ted was there. Terrible Ted started it all. Oh, yeah. I loved The fans jumped all over him when they come to Montreal. You know. 
But that was part, the game then was colorful. We had colorful players on every team, and he was a, a troublemaker. Referees, I always felt, were prejudiced against me anyway, but maybe that was just the way I played the, played the game of hockey. But you could, never, you could never relax in the game with Ted. He kept us in the game. They did, they did a good job, even though I wouldn't tell them that back in those days. Uh, they were always blind and mostly blind, I guess, would be what their problem was. He was so serious about the job he had and worked so hard at it and, and was so voiceless on everything. And he had, he had names the Marines haven't heard about. They always gave you the opportunity to get yourself out of trouble. Red story was, I always had a problem with my mouth sometimes and using a few adjectives and insulting the referees and their ancestries. And Red would always say, what did you say? Give you? And if you were dumb enough to come back and say the same thing again, then you ended up with the penalty and you ended up in the penalty box. At that time, Ted was the most hated man in hockey, basically, you know, because when you played the wings, you always knew Ted was going to be out there and he'd be yapping at you and, uh, and tormenting you and that. A good rivalry, it's great. It's great, to, it's great for the teams and it's, it's great for the fans. I was the youngest of nine children, six boys and three girls, so I learned to fight at a very early age. <laughs> I guess my worst fight was against Bill Ezenicki in Detroit, and uh, Bill and I had been rivals for a long time. Uh, when I went to St. Mike's, he was playing for Oshawa Generals. And they told me the St. Mike's coaches and that, and the players, and, as in Nicky, he's a, he's a tough guy, and, he's, he's, and my attitude at that time, well, I think he'd be a tough guy, but if he thinks he's going to run me out of hockey, he's crazy, because he bleeds the same as I do. I mean, that's how we got there. That's how Henry Richard and Lindsay and these guys got there. How did they get there? From Bantams, Midgets, Juniors, they had guys coming after them left and right and say, we'll keep this guy from getting there, so oh, that's what you think. <laughs> this is going to make a monkey out of you. wants to go at it, we'll just have to go at it and hopefully I'll be able to take care of myself. We were playing in Detroit one night. He hit me in the front of my head just at the hairline with a stick and I started to bleed. And I'm thinking, well, if I let him away with this, my fans, and the place was full. They think I'm scared of him. So I took my stick and I clonked him on the head, just about where he clonked me. Then he drops his stick and his glove. Well then I can't hit him on the head with the stick again. So I gotta drop my stick. He was a strong guy and I thought, oh well, Lindsay, you better be ready for this one. I don't know where his mind was that night, but I got a hold of him with my left arm, and I, every time he'd go to throw the right, I'd block it with my left arm, and I kept hitting and hitting him. Finally, they separated us, and I knocked a tooth out. He had got some, he was bleeding in about two different places besides from where I hit him with the stick. George Gravel, who was the, co the referee that night, George says, you fellas are through for the night. And I'm thinking, thanks, George. The only cut I have is the, the one that I got from the stick. And he's bleeding pretty good. So I'm heading down the boards uh, between the blue lines to get to my dressing room. And Gordy yelled, look out, here he comes. broke away from the 
linesman, and I thought, oh no, I hear I was lucky, I only had that little cut. We're, we're going to be right back into it, and I'm going to get my lesson now. I swung almost from the ice, caught him on the chin, the momentum of his body coming towards me, hitting him on the chin, lifted him right off the ice. And he went back down, landed on his backside, and his head went back and hit the ice. I just straddled him, and uh, I grabbed him by the chest, the shirt, and I'm pulling him and hitting him, and pulling him and hitting him. And Gordy says, Teddy's out. I don't care if he's out or not, I'm going to kill him. We don't try to hurt people, but we always try to protect ourselves. I went to the first aid room and opened up the door and the doctor was stitching Ezzy up and I said, are you all right, Ezzy? And, and he said, I'll get you, you, and used a few adjectives and I thought, oh, I guess I shouldn't have put my head in there. It was really a bloody battle and uh, unfortunately for me, it was Ezzy's blood and uh, not mine. When did you learn how to deal with fear? Some people can't answer that question yet. And they're adults. Did you learn it at 8 years old? Did you learn it at 12 years old? At 16 years old? We got lots of casualties in society. People don't even know how to deal with fear. Whatever that fear might be, whether it's physical or not. See, well, when do you think the kid learns it? And you're going to introduce stuff that's going to scare half them away. Because they don't know why this guy's doing this. And so why should I play a game when I'm 11 years old or 10 years old and I'm going to be hurt playing it? Unless you're a hardened little butter, okay, that sees a way out and say, that's what I'm going to do anyway. And if that guy hurts me, he's going to get hurt back twice as much. And I'm going to tell him, then I got to do it. I grew up in a place called Kirkland Lake in Northern Ontario, in a small town, lots of cold weather. Every school had two rinks in their schoolyard. One was for hockey and one was for skating. And so it was, it was a great place. My father played hockey from 1898 to 1912. He played in what was the forerunner of the National Hockey League. I was a retarded Canadian. I didn't start skating till I was nine. And, but my father, because he played hockey, he never had a pair of skates for me. Because this was 1929, 1930, in the Depression. Hockey skates were only worth $4.75 a pair, but they couldn't afford them. But unfortunately for me, I lived in Northern Ontario, a lady by the name of Mrs. Brady gave me her husband's skates for my first pair of skates. And she had a rink in her backyard. That's where I started to skate. When my dad saw that I liked it, he found that $4.75 for a pair of skates. And from then on, it just multiplied. The best juvenile hockey team that there ever was, he says, and I saw it, and I was, I didn't play for him, but he didn't play for him, but he was there, he says, and I'm listening because I know it was the best juvenile team that I ever saw. So he said, and that was a team from Kirkland Lake. And uh, he mentioned Ted and Gus Mortson too. And he mentioned about four of the players, and I'm kind of got a grin on my face, you know. He said, that was the best damn juvenile team that ever played hockey in Canada or anywhere. He said, that was the best. And I said, well, uh, uh, Percy was, his uh, name was Percy. I said, Perce, uh, I want to tell you something. I said, I was, I, I was on the team that played against them for the championship <laughs> in Port Coburn. Yeah, were you? And I said, yeah, I was. I said, you don't have to tell me about them. I remember them.
for, I was playing for St. Michael's Juniors in Toronto and we were playing, we just finished a game in Hamilton, Ontario. And I'm coming out after the game with my bag over my shoulder and this white haired gentleman said to me, are you Ted Lindsay? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, I'm Carson Cooper, Chief Scout of the Detroit Red Wings. Ever think about playing pro? And uh, of course that lit up my eyes pretty good. And I said to him, I said, yes. And I said, Detroit's my favorite team because in Kirkland Lake, with our cold winters, uh, we could get WJR on a clear night, just like we were in downtown Detroit. And they had two players, Jack Stewart and Jimmy Orlando, who were defensemen. And they were rough and tough, and that was my kind of hockey, so that's why Detroit were my favorite team. Detroit people were lucky when they landed Ted Lindsay. That's all I, what I can tell you. They had some great, great hockey players but they never had a better leader than Ted. Jack Adams and, uh, was uh, our general manager, and Jack Adams was the original coach of the Red Wings whenever Mr. Norris bought them, and he, Mr. Norris had complete faith in him, and he, I understand he never had a contract. It was always a verbal thing with Mr. Norris, and, uh, uh, and he had a, he, had a, he loved hockey. I had a good relationship with him. I could come in and I could kick him in the butt. And he'd hug me and he'd kiss me. And he was godfather for my first son. So he was like a father image. He treated me wonderfully well. He really did. And we, our, I guess our philosophies were different. And uh, when I, the more I learned, the more uh, my feelings changed. He thought he was the Lord Almighty. That summer when I was going to training camp for the first time with the Red Wings, I was invited to Detroit to see Mr. Adams and go to a ball game. That was the old butter up. They were trying to make you think you were somebody important, I guess. But I remember walking into Olympia in the middle of the summer, and of course, it was in, all in darkness, uh, but you could still see all the seats. And when I w remember walking in, how big a building it was and all that, uh, it was a great place to play hockey. Had the best ice in the National Hockey League uh, by far, which was always a handicap to us because Toronto had awful ice. And those guys that labored on that ice in Toronto, they come into Detroit on the, the good ice that we had, they'd be about a half a stride faster than they normally were, which was a handicap for us. But Olympia itself, uh, Joe Lewis will never be Olympia. They had a lot of character in it. There was an atmosphere in it. There was a lot of nostalgia in the building also. I've always thought that the fans who watched the Canadian and Detroit game in the old Olympia uh, saw probably what hockey uh, at its best. Detroit, I found after my second year in Detroit, was the best franchise in the National Hockey League. It just it was a great hockey city. It was better than Toronto and better than Montreal. And uh, you say that to some of those Canadians, and they they look at you like you're nuts. trained for one month. Mr. Adams started coming around and said, wanted to sign me, wanted to sign me. And I kept saying, no, I'm going to go back to St. Mike's. And my thinking there was that if I turn pro with the Red Wings, I'm going to be sitting on the bench probably. And at that time, we only played 50 games. And I go back to St. Mike's, I'm going to play 35 minutes a game, 40 minutes a game. So that was my thinking. And so I, I read couple of days and we used to get $25 for the week for our meals 
And back in 44, that was a lot of money for our meals and for our laundry and dry cleaning. And uh, But at that age, we didn't do too much dry cleaning. We used to wear our clothes with spots on them. But uh, so he'd always say, well, do you need some money? And so I'd end up with an extra five or ten dollars from him. And that would happen two or three times a week. And all the other guys knew I was getting extra money. And, but I, you know, I didn't think anything of it at the time because I was just not saying I'm going back to St. Mike's because I was trying to be cagey. I was just really believing I was going back to St. Mike's. So finally, he called St. Michael's and talked to Father Mallon, who was the athletic director. And he said, what are you offering this kid, Lindsay? And Father Mallon says, uh, well, what do you mean, what are we offering him? Well, he says, all I ever get out of him is he says, I'm going back to St. Mike's. He said, well, we're not offering him anything. And if he wants to, if he's saying he's coming back to St. Mike's, he's doing it on his own. So then I got a call from my coach, who was Paul McNamara, I'm a coach at St. Mike's. And uh, apparently Father Mallon had talked to him. And Paul knew that I wasn't going to become a doctor or lawyer. Uh, engineer or anything like that. He kind of knew I was focused where I was going. And he just said, Ted, he said, opportunity comes once in a lifetime. And he said, uh, this might be your opportunity. And if you don't take it, you might never get it again. And so I listened to him, I respected him. Uh, and uh, so I, I talked to Jack Adams and I ended up signing for the with the Red Wings. and. They never gave any bonuses or anything like that back in those days, but he gave me a $2,000 bonus for signing. That was for signing away my amateur card. And I made $5,500 for my first two years. I had a two-year no minor league clause in my contract. And so that was my first negotiation. My mother never saw me play hockey till I played my first game for the Detroit Red Wings in Maple Leaf Gardens. That was the first time she'd ever seen me play. We lived at a place called Ma Shaw's. Ma was home was about a block away from Olympia. She was uh, widowed, her husband had died, and. She was a hockey fan, and she had four bedrooms upstairs. And uh, so we lived with Ma Shaw, and uh, she was our mother away from home. And our, we didn't need our meals there, but uh, after games, uh, we could use her refrigerator, and we wanted a beer or two after before we went out to eat. Uh, she was, I say, she was our mother, and it was a wonderful life for her because uh, she loved the guys like they were her own, her own children. Red Kelly lived there. Gordy Howe. Marty Pavlich. When Metro pressed, I got traded from Chicago to Detroit. We made room for Metro because he was single and we were all single, so we wanted him to be comfortable and. So we moved him in with us, and uh, so and before we lived there, there were fellows like Jack Stewart, Bill Quackenbush, Harry Lumley. Uh, they all lived with Masha. having a line that was called a production line. They were probably as strong a line as, as any line that ever played the game. Sid Abel, Gordy Howe and myself. We were very productive in the gold producing end of it and being in the automotive capital of the world, some very brilliant newspaper writer figured, well, that would be a good name for the line would be the production line. We knew where each other were on the ice at all times. We never never had to look to see where Gordy was or Sid was. We knew just by where the puck was on the ice. Sid made a statement one time. Sid was a hell of a hockey player. 
and uh, always in his position. He says, all I do is stay in the center ice and deal with cards. <laughs> the guy without the puck is always the guy that makes the play. He, he gets into the holes, so we'd know where the holes were on the ice. We'd throw the puck there, and either Sid would be there or Gordy would be there, and people were amazed at uh, how did he do that. Well, it was a case that we instinctively, we anticipated, and that's what it was. Gordy and I left home young and we were away from our home. Sid came back from the Second World War and I guess you'd say he was our father image. I was a guy that had to be curtailed on the ice. I was always blowing up and Gordy was the kind of guy that had to be awakened on the ice because he was so lackadaisical, methodical and so he had, uh, Sid had both of our respects and so he could generate Gordy and he could slow me down and uh, we spent a lot of time at uh, Sid and Gloria's house. Uh, she was a wonderful Italian lady and we used to get some wonderful pasta meals uh, at, uh, at Gloria and Sid's house. I've always said uh, as far as Gordy Howe is concerned that he's the greatest hockey player I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he could do it all. He was a he was a good offensively, good defensively. He was strong, very strong physically. Uh, Gordy and I had a good relationship. Uh, we were, we ran together. We were both single. Uh, we chummed around. We ran around together. All the time. There was never, we never went any place that one or the other wasn't there. Uh, uh, and we were teammates for 12 years, uh, line mates, I should say. And. Uh, and it was just like, you know, here you are, as I said, he's the greatest hockey player I've ever seen in my life, and you have this opportunity that you're playing with him. And that, that was a great privilege. Uh, uh, when I started to go with uh, a lady, and then I ended up marrying that lady, uh, of course, then naturally, our Gordy and my companionship kind of separated there because he didn't come home with me. And, uh, but uh, within another year after, I think it was a year, maybe two years at the most, then Gordy got married, so uh, our lives changed completely. It was a different person once I put my hockey uniform on and put my skates on. I guess a Jekyll and Hyde would be a pretty good description. It was amazing how fellows react. You insult their ancestors and all that. Used a lot of adjectives. Ted could swear pretty good, but uh, he was always th threatening and he'd, uh, I'll cut your heart out or I'll shove this stick down your throat. Tried to get rile other guys, the opposition up, get them mad at me so they weren't thinking about hockey, they were thinking about, I want to get that Lindsay, I want to get that Lindsay. The night was the night to get Lindsay. <laughs> Just a great guy, all around. Uh, you know, you could listen to him talk about stories and tell stories forever. Great to sit down and have a beer with him. When I originally picked up the cup, I never knew what I was doing, never even thought that I was creating something that was a tradition. And I was very PR conscious to creating good relationships with the fans that we had, and we had great arguments. They only had the chicken wire at the end of the rink. And when I picked the cup up, I was taking it over towards the board so that the people, the fans, could get a good look at it. It wasn't uh, uh, that I was going to let them keep it or anything else like that. 
And I didn't put it over my head like they do today. I, I would just carry it in my arms so that they could see it. And, I, and of course, Camel had just made the presentation of the Stanley Cup uh, to Jack Adams and uh, after we had won it. And when I picked the cup up, uh, they, Adams probably looked, what is that idiot Lindsay going to do with the cup now? I mean, is, is he going to throw it or what? But uh, no, give me uh, a little more credit for common sense and brains. And, uh, but I would imagine that's what went through their mind, that what, what is he going to do with it now? But I didn't drop it, didn't throw it, and uh, it became a tradition. I used to hear stories about Ted Lindsay when I was, uh, when I started playing junior hockey in London. And uh, I was always a Toronto fan growing up, so uh, it wasn't until I moved to London that I started hearing about the way Ted played. So when I finally played for the Wings and got to meet him, it was a huge thrill for me. And uh, it was, it was a, he was a great inspiration in, in winning the Cup in 97. We're in New York, they're playing, they're playing the Rangers. And he got into a squabble on the ice with a fellow by the name of Steve Kravchek, a defenseman. Now in those days, the, bo uh, the penalty box was one box. They, they, they sit one on each side of the timekeeper, and the next thing you know, they'd be out of the game, and the timekeeper's ducking, and <laughs> everything's going. Anyway, I, I give these to, them two a penalty, and I can see it's not going to end, you know. So I skated in over the box, the door still open. I said, look it, either you guys throw a punch in here, it's going to cost you $25. And I said, that's a lot of money. It was for us in that way. And Lindsay looks at Kraft Check, he ha ha Kraft Check, you ain't going to hit me. You haven't got $25, he said. <laughs> You know, it's priceless. The people, the fans don't hear this, you know. But uh, I had to skate away. I was laughing. Yeah. And, you know, and he was probably right. Kraftcheck probably didn't have $25. <laughs> oh, yeah. There was one night in Detroit, uh, we were playing Toronto. And uh, again, there was just the screen. And by then they had started and they put screen along the side. Like, again, it was like chicken wire, the same they had down at the end of the rink. And we were trying to get the equalizer goal and uh, we were had the team pinned up in there. And the whistle went in the game, we're mad. Glenn Skoll was going by and somebody spit on him. That was enough to get us all riled up in a hurry. So I'm, I'm up on the boards. There's enough room to get my skates on there, and I got a hold of the screen, and I'm over the boards. And Sawchuck, he gets himself hung. He's got one leg on one side of the screen. He can't get the other leg over, and he's hung there. And, uh, and I'm walking on the top of the seats, and seats, and this woman says, "Don't hit him! Don't hit him! Don't hit him! I'm gonna kill him!" <laughs> But you know, then you come to your senses and figure out a poor guy who was stupid to do that. And, you know, you're you're all geared up, you're all warmed up, and what, what are you going to beat this guy up for? What's it going to gain you? So you kind of back off and leave it all be. church was not as big as hockey, and the Pope wasn't as big as Rocket Richard. Rocket wanted to see me dead every night, and of course I wanted to see him dead every night, but uh, he, uh, he was tough and he was good. He was, he's the greatest hockey player. I was talking about Howe is the greatest all-around hockey player, but from the blue line in, there's never been a better hockey player than Rocket Richard. And that includes present-day players. 
he was just so strong, so focused, so dedicated to winning. And when he came over that blue line, he had had that puck on his stick. He was going to get a shot at your net. Uh, that was one thing that was for sure. I can remember the battles that, uh, that we had against Montreal and Montreal with the Rocket and, and Teddy and uh, boy, there was no uh, there was no giving an inch anywhere. And uh, but Teddy was always the inspiration that got everybody over the top. Ed Lindsay draws a minor penalty for cross-checking Morris Richard. Well, we had a good rivalry only because he was so good and their team was so good. Uh, uh, and naturally, we played Montreal so often, and we uh, not only in the, the regular season, but we seem to play them a lot in the playoffs. And, uh, so we had a rivalry and a hatred, which goes hand in hand. We were playing in Olympia one night, and I got into an altercation with Jeffrey on, and we were just behind looking towards center ice, I was to the left of the Red Wing net and uh, a little bit off the boards and uh, Jeffrey on and I are squared off and all of a sudden I got hit on the jaw on the left hand si side of my face. This was uh, in the playoffs and uh, there was the game, the, the game was had stopped, I was in the corner and Lindsay, uh, Rocket wasn't much to talk. He didn't do anything. Lindsay was really giving it to the Rocket. And Rocket all of a sudden let a, let a left go. And as if you dropped your handkerchief on the ice, he went down like a rag. And you could feel the, the uh, feeling of that right through the crowd, right through the team. And they, were ne they never won that series. They, they, lo they lost that series on that one punch. That's how much he meant to them. It, it, it completely destroyed the crowd and his own team to see that happen. Their leader went down like that, you know? But I remember that well. And I went down like somebody dropped the organ. I had an organ at Olympia and I got dropped like I had the organ dropped on me. I went right down to my knees and the old rocket came around there when I was concentrating on on Jeffrey on and he, he nailed me and he nailed me good. I didn't, I got down to my knees but I didn't go quite out. Uh, thank goodness for that. The Maple Leaf Gardens uh, got a call and a, we were playing there on Saturday and Monday. The Maple Leaf Gardens got a call that if Howe and Lindsay showed up, they would be shot. Well, back in the 50s, you didn't have these idiots running around the world like they have today. And uh, so we didn't make too much of it. Someone had threatened to shoot Ted. The police and the security people took it very seriously. Ted thought nothing of it. After all, about 50 guys had already threatened to cut his head off. <laughs> but we were in the room getting dressed for practice, for the, the game and the warm-up. And we had a young guy by the name of uh, Marcel Bonin, who was, uh, came to the club probably about a month after the season started from Montreal. Couldn't speak a word of English, but he uh, learned how to say ham and eggs. So he had ham and eggs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for about the first month that he was in Detroit until he learned how to say a few other words. And, but we're getting dressed for the game. And he also was a bear wrestler, and he chewed glass. He was a, he was a character. But he, uh, we're getting dressed for the game, and uh, Gordy said to him, he says, Marcel, he says, you put my sweater on. Marcel, by then he's talking to English. He says, oh no, Gordy, I know what you're thinking. You put your own sweater on, and all the guys are laughing. So we're going out for the warm-up, and the guy said, well now, 
don't skate too close to us, you two guys, because the guy's liable to be a bad shot. Going to this third period, we're behind by a goal, and I was lucky enough to get the tie, the tying goal in the third period. Then we go into sudden death overtime, and I was lucky enough to get the winning goal in overtime. Well, everybody, there were 16,000 people in Maple Leaf Gardens, and there's 15,500 of them booing. And so after the guys are all through jumping over me, and, and I was so happy, nobody could have killed me that night anyway. And uh, I go to center ice, and don't ask me how or why I ever did it, but I, I was just like I was in a tank and a turret, and I just went right around center ice with my stick as a gun, and I was like a machine gun. And a lot of the booze stopped, and people recognized, hey, Lindsay's got a sense of humor. The interesting thing in the six-team league was that uh, we never spoke to each other. In other words, if I on the Detroit Red Wings, if I was in Toronto, or in Montreal and you're walking down either Young Street, St. Catherine Street, Montreal, you're near the Forum or near Maple Leaf Gardens. If you saw a Toronto player or a Montreal player, you'd cross the street so that you wouldn't have to recognize each other. We just never spoke to each other. That was a feeling. The, the, the feeling of, of, uh, of uh, against each, each other was, was, was prominent there. There was no question about it. We, uh, we often had our, our Traveling together, Montreal and, and the Bruins would be on the same train. Uh, our, our Pullman car would be someplace, and theirs is someplace else. And we may have to walk by or walk through their car to go to the diner. And uh, it, it wasn't something that you look forward to because uh, uh, you knew that they didn't care for you too much, and you felt the same to them. If you got a you know, an elbow, or you got some high stick or, or something, uh, you didn't have to retaliate immediately. Uh, you just got the number. We never, I guess we never played to hurt anybody. But if anybody wanted to, was going to get hurt, it didn't want it to be you, it had to be the other guy. And there were a lot of tough guys. I ran into a lot of, I ran into a lot of good men in my time. Ted had one of those faces that holds three three days of rain, you know, <laughs> because but it's all scar face. I got a lot of involuntary plastic surgery because uh, my face was reformed, I guess. I wasn't handsome, never was handsome, never will be, but I think it improved my looks, uh, looks a little bit. Other than my nose, which is spread over my face pretty well. And, the cartilage, there's no cartilage. I don't have an exact number, but I, I'm saying I've had between five and 600 stitches. Uh, but again, uh, you know, there's 10 here, there's 15 here, there's three here, over there. And of course, most of those I got in probably my first seven years uh, till I smartened myself up a little bit. <laughs> and didn't get, in the, well, I guess I get into as many fights, but maybe I was getting better at it. Very, very aggressive. And he earned every stitch he got in his face. He earned every one of them. The last two weeks of the of this entertainment season, I guess you'd call it, we would go up into the Upper Peninsula. That would be probably in uh, late May, early June. We ended up being at Marquette State Prison, which was a, a capital punishment prison where they had murderers and bank robbers and all these very sophisticated jail birds, I guess would be the best way to describe it. But they also had a rink in the prison yard. I was kind of a favorite because I was so penalized so much that I was like one of the prisoners and they felt like I, I was a prisoner. I was a prisoner in the National Hockey League penalty box. So I was I got along good with them. And then of course the warden asked Jack Adams, he said, would you bring your hockey team up here to play in the prison yard? 
And Adam said, well, figured it, no way and this guy is going to be able to come up with this. Adam said, well, if you pay to fly the team up and fly them back and put them up at the hotel, I'll do that. And Adams figured that would be the last of it. He got the money and he, from the local business people. And we play in the prison yard. We take, we split the team up. We put Sachuk into the prison goal. Took the, we took the prison goalie and put him in our net. We defensemen we split up. The lines we split up. They they had made a Stanley Cup in the uh, workshop at the prison yard that we played for, and. It was just great. It was wonderful to see. There was a gang there called the Purple Gang at that time. <clears throat> they were the Jewish Mafia in the early 30s. And these, all these gentlemen were all older, just class people, really were. And prisons, I learned, were like our society. If you're a rapist, you're the scum of the prison. And if you're a bank robber, you're the president of the prison. I mean, this is this is the way this is the way they rationalize their, and that, that's you know because the guy had a brain, you know, he didn't doesn't go around just shooting people. He, he puts thoughts into things. And we always said, you know, do we have to worry about what's going on in the prison? I mean, if somebody take us a hostage. They said you never have to worry about that because we know everything that goes on in this prison. And if one, anybody ever thought to take what you people are doing coming up here, if any guy was stupid enough to do that, he'd be dead before he took one step. As hockey players, I don't think we had to worry about our career. Uh, but I, I must say that we probably got every bit as much out of it as what they got out of it because we recognize the other side of life. Uh, we talk about how good hockey has been to me, what it has done for me, the opportunities that it's given to me. And then you see these people, they had the same opportunity as you or I, but they took a different road. And recognizing they thought they were going to get away with it, but they didn't get away with it. And, but they, they were paying their debt to society and so we uh, had a wonderful time with them. Now the first the game I had in there, uh, I gave somebody a penalty, right? And uh, the guy is ripping me apart all the way to the penalty box, you know, this and that with language you wouldn't want anybody to hear. So uh, Gordy comes over, Gordy and I were always friends too, and Gordy says, uh, do you know who that is? I says, no, I haven't got a clue. He says, that's Ted Lindsay. I says, no kidding. I signed Red Story, <laughs> and so, so. But we we started off at loggerheads the first time I stepped on the ice, because he was testing me. You know, he would test everybody. But uh, as as the years grew on, I got to realize how great he was as a hockey player, and what great desire he had as a hockey player, and what he meant to the National Hockey League. Playoffs back in our time, there was only semifinals and finals with the six teams. And we won the league uh, seven years in a row, eight years out of nine, and that gave us each a thousand dollars a man. And when you won the semifinals, that was another thousand dollars a man. And when you won the, if you were lucky enough to win the Stanley Cup, that was another thousand dollars, which in my mathematics comes to three thousand dollars. But when we get our playoff check, would be maybe around $2,335. We had no voice in, because it was just the players were supposed to share in it, but it ended up it was Adams was making, giving splits to some of the other people, whether it was the paper boy in the corner of McGraw and Grand River or whoever it was, or whether it was going in his pocket, I don't know. But we as players had no option to be able to question. And if you question anything, you were traded or you went to the miners. After being in the league for a while, uh, I recognized what a dictatorship uh, the league was and what control 
they had over the players, which is, and I have no problem with that as long as things are fair. And, uh, but uh, things weren't fair. If they had the rules that they have today, they had them back then, all those owners have been in jail. If you sign a contract, you sign it, I would sign it, say, in Jack Adams' office. Uh, I couldn't take that contract out of the room. And if I asked him, he'd say, no, that's against the bylaws of the league. And well, all of us were just young Canadian guys. We're playing hockey because we love to play it, and that's our love. And we didn't know whether this was the law or anything. We weren't interested in the law. We were interested in playing hockey. And that was to their advantage. You know, so we were kind of, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of a difficult set of circumstances there. But uh, if we had a legitimate complaint about something, we probably were going to have to just live with it. <laughs> there wasn't a hell of a lot we could do about it. Most of us. Uh, in the uh, 50s, and we were so happy to wear the uh, Red Wings uniform and the Canadian uniform, so really uh, uh, we didn't uh, bother too much about salary. We wanted to play, we loved the game, hockey was a passion to us, and wearing uh, the Red Wings or the Canadian uniform was, uh, uh, was a dream coming true since we were really a little boy. So, but after a few years, I suppose, uh, you realize that the career, uh, hockey career could be very short. And uh, you get married, you get a family, the responsibility add up. And uh, it makes you uh, say, well, uh, this is a very short career. Uh, what can I do to uh, uh, protect uh, uh, my family? We needed a voice, we needed a collective voice, not a, an individual voice. We needed something collective and that we could put our gripes together, put our complaints together and be able to present it to management and ownership. There were a lot of questions that we didn't know the answers to and uh, there were a lot of people who were undecided as to what really we should do. But they did think that if they were represented as a group that this would be a better, a better uh, system for them. The, obviously the owners didn't think that and the owners wanted us to be divided individually. That you would ask for uh, an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars in your contract and they'd say, tell you we can't afford it, We're, our crowds are down and uh, you didn't have much bargaining power. And uh, uh, I, I think this is way uh, we all were kind of uh, stymied as to how we could you know, get ahead if you, if you had a good year uh, to get paid more and uh, if you had a for a year, maybe you should have got paid less, but uh, nevertheless, it, it was a continual battle between the players individually and, and, and the owners. In forming a players association, the six-team league, uh, and when you don't talk to each other, that's first of all is your biggest obstacle, is uh, how do you form something when you don't talk to each other? But the other obstacle was the fact that if you don't have the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens, you're never going to put it together. So you go to the strongest point, and the strongest point was Montreal had a player by the name of Doug Harvey, great talented defenseman, but also a very intelligent individual. I think people were um, they were they were pleased that somebody was standing up for us, and this was the kind of a player we needed. We needed more players like him, and we couldn't get enough of them like him to to stand up and, and to be counted, because everybody at the time was was uh, they were threatened by the owners, and they were told if they if they got involved with Ted Lindsay or Doug Harvey, that was the end of them. They would be sent by Toronto to Pittsburgh or Boston to Hershey, wherever. And you know we were we were uh, we were. Uh, captives of, of their system and it, it really was a tough system to break and if you were married you had a family you didn't want to lose your job I had spoken to Bob Feller for about two years before that because he was the head of the American League Baseball Players Association and I was if I was going to put this together I wanted to show the owners that we had some brains and we weren't interested in running hockey we were interesting to have a, a voice in hockey. We had the press conference, 
And we kept that secret from October to late January. And I think that hurt the managers and the owners as much as anything, that, that we could keep a secret in the dressing room for that length of time. Coming back to practice the next day, I knew that at Olympia in the Red Wing dressing room, the players wouldn't be getting dressed for practice, that uh, Adams would be prancing on the floor and parading, and, and rightfully he was, and uh, there was no practice, and uh, he went around asking, you for this, you for this, and came to Marty Pavlich, who Marty and I were in business together, and he didn't ask Marty, and he didn't ask me if I was for this, and but you know, you're asking young guys, and they're, he's got a threat on them because he'll send them home today, and they don't owe you a nickel. Jack Adams uh, took a dim view of anybody in that dressing room starting something as outrageous as a players association. And uh, Jack Adams would trade you just if you looked at him cross-eyed. So Ted went. Yeah, there was no love lost between those two. He was told he, he was ruining the game, that he didn't love the game, that he was uh, hurting his teammates. I'm sure he was told all of those things. And uh, he had the resolve and the foresight to, uh, the, to know that he was right, and he stuck with it. Uh, maybe he didn't know he was right. Maybe he wasn't sure. Uh, but he felt he was right. And uh, as it turns out, he was. The things that he committed to do, he didn't have to do. I mean, he was a successful player, recognized by the players and the public. I mean, he said, Dick, there's certain things that aren't just right, and they should be made right. Okay? And the Toronto guys, I mean, we stood by it, boy. I mean, uh, we were strong. I mean, and we had a lot of pressure put on us from Mr. Smythe. I mean, Mr. Smythe built the leaves and he built the gardens and, and had a lot to do with the NHL and, and, and he created the atmosphere of, of being champions. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have no argument with that. We had dollars sent around who was transferred to Chicago here. We had Doug Harvey, we had Ted who was uh, traded to uh, and I'm sure without any proof, but I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that all those players were working very hard uh, to start uh, an association. To ask questions and to be well informed and to educate yourself was not a knock against your love of the game. It, uh, it made you a better pro and I think that the players today, um, you know, have, have gone that course. I was traded to Chicago in that summer of 57. I just had one of my best years ever as a Red Wing. He was an all-star. You don't trade all-stars, but I think he was being reprimanded for his interest in the uh, Players Association, without any doubt. I'd still do the same thing today. It was something that had to be done. I was still a Red Wing when I was in Chicago. I had a tattoo on my forehead, and over my heart, and on my backside. The lawyers uh, have all, had always told us, you're going to have to have a union. And I said, I can sell an association, but I can't sell a union, because these small Canadian town boys, they don't like the word union. Association they would buy. When the players could see that this pressure was being put on, we, all six teams recognized we're going to have to have a union. And so, going to have a union, now we have to, we're an international sport, so we have to certify in Canada, we have to certify in the United States. So we decided to pick Toronto to vote in Canada. And I figured Detroit would be strong enough, so I picked Detroit to vote in the United States. And uh, you talk about pressure. You look at the roster of the Toronto Maple Leafs in 1956-57. Look at the roster and those names. Those were men. Because every one of them, they had a vote. And it was a silent vote. And. Uh, they voted for the Players Association, and Smythe couldn't believe it. They had, they had pressure from the president of the league, Campbell, to their lawyers, to their coaches, and everything was threat, threat, threat. In Detroit, as I found out later on, 
I wish I'd have known about it because I would have had the vote in Chicago. But Adams took Gordy Howe into a room and said, are you for this? And he said, I just want to play hockey. And that's all we all wanted to do was play hockey. And all Gordy had to say was, well, Mr. Adams, I think we, could take a, we should take a look at it. So Adams comes out and says there's no certification. They, they voted it down. Well, the players didn't vote. If I had been in Detroit and not in Chicago, uh, that vote would have been in the favor of the association. Uh, I think I had the support of the players and it wasn't the fact that the players were against it, that they never got the opportunity. Adams didn't give them that opportunity. I was very disappointed. I mean, uh, this was something I think that all the guys wanted. It certainly didn't destroy my life, it destroyed a dream. Uh, and I think destroyed a great opportunity for a lot of hockey, old hockey players, I'm talking the ones in the 30s and the early 40s, that would have benefited quite well. I know what help the association has done to a number of players who weren't as fortunate to come out of the game and to make enough money on it to, to maybe get into a business and who've had trouble just getting by. And, uh, Ted doesn't know this because he, he hadn't thought about when he planned it, but it was through that beginning and money was raised that was eventually filtered down to these people and it, it was a Samaritan type act to help them out and, and it all began with uh, Ted standing up and saying we should become an association. So I think he deserves a lot of credit for it. And I want to be the one to say thank you very much, Ted. I would like to be remembered as a, a player that gave everything he had every night, uh, never cheated the fans. As I've always said, I, I played for the people. I didn't play for management. Certainly played for myself for the love of the game. There hasn't been anybody like Ted Lindsay in the organization since he left. Get so much respect from everyone, even the young kids who, who obviously never get a chance to see a player or neither did I know of him and know what he's done for the players. And him, you got to respect because he's been a great asset, not only for the game of hockey, but I think for life in general.
Thank <laughs> you. 